My interest in archery began from an interest in entertainment that involves the sport. This includes movies like The Avengers, Mockingjay, 300, The Lord of the Rings, and Immortals. After something to the south. It's towards the hospital. They're circling back around. Come on. Targeting the hospital. What both of these famous archers have in common is that they both wield traditional bows without many extra attachments like stabilizers or pulling mechanisms. The modern spin on these archers is that they use very high-tech and advanced arrows, such as the explosive arrow seen in the previous clips, in addition to their regular arrows. These are two movies in the world of entertainment that have modern plot lines but also have prominent archery roles. Legends of archery date back many thousands of years since before the Common Era. In the eastern worlds of Africa and Asia, the bow and arrow has been used to defend land from foreign invasion and also to help expand the empires of the ancient world. The samurai of Japan began using the bow and arrow during the 3rd century Common Era because it was emerging as a noble practice as well as a sign that they were elite fighters. However, unlike the other archers in the world during this time period, the samurai began using asymmetrical bows. They began doing this because the center of the bow created the most vibration and friction after the arrow was released. This friction was forcing the soldiers to wear gloves when shooting, and the release of the arrow was not perfectly straight, causing less accurate shot. In addition to using asymmetrical bows, the bows of the Japanese were also incredibly long, and the archers that wielded them were often mounted on horses. The bow length allowed the arrows to be launched farther and with greater force. The following video is a clip showing a woman practicing Kaido archery, which is archery using the asymmetrical bow. Over one millennia earlier than the age of the samurai, on the African continent, Pharaoh Thutmose III and his engineers were revolutionizing the use of the bow and arrow. As barbarian forces from the north were moving their forces further into the Egyptian empire, th the construction of the war chariot had begun. This chariot, when utilized by archers, was a force of mass destruction against the invading barbarians. However, before understanding why the bow and arrow played such a pivotal role in defeating the barbarians, we must first understand how the Egyptians created their bows.
At the same time that the horse and the chariot came to Egypt, so did a revolutionary new bow, the composite bow. Very, very powerful bow. The bows they had before were just made of wood. This would be very clumsy in a chariot. And wood needs to be a certain length. If you, if you can't have a short bow made of wood, because that will only come back so far before that happens. So you have to have a certain amount of length for a wooden bow to work. Also, don't be confused by its great girth. It, that doesn't necessarily signify power. I can pull that back with one finger quite easily. What we've got with the composite bow is something that's short, therefore very usable on the tight platform of a chariot, but immensely powerful. And it's immensely powerful for two reasons. One is its composite materials, and two is its shape. You see this unstrung, you'll see it's a completely different shape. It comes into this sort of flattened W shape. And that means all these materials are pre-stressed so that when it's pulled back, these are already trying to go that way. So it's much more efficient spring. And the way that happens is you start with wood, just as a former. The wood is jointed to give you the angles you want in that. And then you laminate on strips of horn from the water buffalo, water buffalo horn. This is the power of the bow. This is the muscles. It's a wonderful material for resisting compression. So if we think of this as the skeleton, and this is then the muscles on here, we're storing all that energy. We can then pre-stress the shape. But there's so much power in this horn that it would, it would break apart unless it was held together. But like our body is held together by tendons. And you actually use sinew. This is the sinew from an ox. If you hammer them, bash them with a stone, they become quite fibrous, start to pull apart. And if you keep working it, you will get it as fine as hair. And extremely tough as well. I mean, this is, this is incredibly, just even one strand is an incredibly strong material. I cannot break it. And that is then glued around the horn and the wood. And you do layers and layers. And all the art of making a bow is in the laying of the sinew. And it's all held together with this, which is the dried swim bladders of fish. So you just break this stuff up and boil it in water. And you get this wonderful viscous glue. Today, making modern composite bows, we use carbon fibre, doing the same job as the buffalo horn. We use fibreglass, exactly the same as this sinew, and it's bonded together with a resin, just like this fish glue. So it really was a revolutionary technology at its time, and it absolutely changed the face of warfare. It enabled the Egyptians to go out onto the battlefield with their chariots and with their hit and run tactics, and that was new, and that created an empire. Ancient Egypt. For over 3,000... As the country grows richer, its neighbors grow bolder. Now archaeologists have revealed Egypt's brilliant strategy to repel the foreign threat. A strategy devised by its greatest warrior king, Thutmose III. Maneuvering this high-tech apparatus takes skill and lots of practice. Two men have to work together in a confined space, the driver and the archer. Chariot, horses and soldiers have to form a single unit to be able to react quickly in battle. Years of training were needed before they could go to war. So they could be sure of hitting their targets, moving at high speed over uneven ground. 200 years later, during the reign of Pharaoh Ramesses II, archers positioned on war chariots were still one of the most influential weapons of war. Arguably the most powerful pharaoh of the Egyptian empire, Pharaoh Ramesses II led the Egyptian armies on a conquest of Syria. 
Using the bow and arrow atop his royal chariot, Pharaoh Ramses II saved his own life by plowing down the enemy forces as he was surrounded and striking many enemies with arrows. One of the most prominent times of use of longbow archery was during the 100-year war between France and England. The Battle of Crecy, fought in August of 1346, was the largest battle ever recorded in which longbowmen fought against knights. The battle was fought in front of the Crecy Wadcourt Ridge. The French army was led by King Philip IV himself against the English army led by King Edward III. This battle was so important because King Philip's army numbered at 40,000 troops, whereas King Edward III's army numbered at a mere 12,000. 7,000 of these troops were longbowmen. The following video details more about what occurred leading up to the famous battle and how the heavily outnumbered English defeated the French. It was the weapon that took on the might of feudal France and shook it to its core. The skill and courage of English bowmen changed the face of war on the medieval battlefield. Look at this forest of arrows behind me. That's the strength of military archery. Lots of archers all shooting together, all ranging together and dropping their arrows into a killing zone. This is just with 70 archers shooting three arrows. Imagine an English army with 7,500 archers. The effect is devastating. The defining campaign for the longbow took place at the beginning of the Hundred Years' War. In 1340, Edward III laid claim to the French throne and launched a series of dramatic raids into northern France. These raids were called chevauchées. The principal weapon was fire. Hit and run lightning attacks. What the English king was doing, what Edward was doing, was he was saying to the French, look, your king's not protecting you. He's not looking after you. Where is he? Where is his army now? If you swore loyalty to me, things would be better. Northern France was full of rich pickings. By August, the English army had filled their saddlebags with loot. They'd caused havoc, sacking Caen and skirting around Paris. Now they were heading for Calais and home. But King Philippe of France had assembled an enormous army of over 20,000 men. He was hot on their heels. Philippe was determined to cut the English off from their ships. They'd blocked Edward's escape by destroying all the bridges over this river, the Somme. And by the time the English got here, they could hear the distant rumble of the French army, sounding like thunder. In August 1346, Edward III's army was trapped. According to the chronicler Froissart, King Philippe of France's massive army of over 20,000 men was closing in fast. The French had burned all the bridges over this river, the Somme, and there seemed no way home for the English without a fight. Then one day, they captured a Frenchman, a man called Gobin Agas, and for a bribe, he told the English of a secret crossing place, a place where at low tide, there was a man-made causeway, a place called Blanche Tac, near Seineville. At low tide the next day, at dawn, the English army crossed. They could only cross 12 abreast, and the chroniclers tell us that the longbowmen went first. The water was chest deep. We can imagine them with their bows above their heads, keeping them dry. But on the other side were the Picardy militia, led by Godem du Fay. And among his troops were some 600 Genoese crossbowmen. The longbowmen would have been sitting ducks as the bolts from these weapons feathered the water as they were trying to cross. They couldn't turn back because of the main French army behind them. But how did they manage to cross in the face of so much resistance on the other bank? There's a tantalizing clue 
in a manuscript that sits in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. It shows the mounted archers still on their horses, galloping and splashing across the ford, shooting their bows as they went. If Froissart's account is true, then maybe the English mounted archers drove back the Picardy militia like this at Blanche Tac. The Battle of Crecy was an extraordinary victory, founded on the perfect combination of expert archers, supreme bows, and the right tactics. It marked the height of the power of the longbow. Well, what we've got here is your longbow. It's a very simple weapon, made famous during the Hundred Years' War. 14th and the 15th century, it's a very simple thing. It's the heart and the sapwood, the inside and the outside of the yew tree from the tree trunk. The string, it's just linen string, a piece of cow horn on each end, and yet you have a weapon that can shoot one of these well over 300 paces. But look at the arrow, it has a barbed point, it's called a broadhead. Once it's inside your body, you can't pull it out. The arrow shaft, wooden, it's from the ash. Goose feathers. These are called the fletchings. In fact, the man who makes the bow is called the bowyer. The man who makes the arrow, the fletcher. The man who makes the arrow point, the arrow smith. The man who makes the string, the string fellow. It's all a family business. But once you put the whole thing together, you've got a murder weapon. See what makes it so deadly? You can shoot fast. The wounds at the other end, incredibly painful. Let me show you how simple it is. You put the arrow on, you look at the target, you bring him back and simply let him go. You had to train by law, at least from the age of seven. You'd shoot for two hours after church every Sunday. It changes your muscle shape. Your one shoulder on the right thickens. Your right forearm becomes stronger. He would stand there, pouring the arrows down until he felt as if his arms were breaking. To better understand the training aspect behind the bow and arrow, and to get a feel for what it would be like to use a bow, I decided to purchase one of my own. I decided to order a grey fiberglass recurve bow from eBay. After shooting with it at an empty soccer field and in my backyard, I decided that I wanted to practice using a target. This led me to search for an archery range that I could visit. The one that I found is called Hall's Archery Range in Manchester, Connecticut. Before I started shooting, there are a few things that I need to do to prepare. First, I need to string my bow. When I first started going to the range, I had been stringing the bow by hand. Doing this method, I would hold the lower limb of the bow with my legs and pull the upper limb back until I could get the string on. However, I, lear I later learned that this is a dangerous method and should not be practiced. This, l this led me to discover the bow stringer, which is shown in this image. It makes stringing and unstringing the bow very easy. After stringing it, I needed to get an arm guard the arm guard is positioned on the forearm of the arm that is holding the bow. This is to protect your arm from the string after the arrow is released. Once I had strung my bow and put my arm guard on, I was ready to practice. I set the target at 5 yards away and then I knocked my arrow. The knocking of the arrow is one of the most important steps when using a bow and arrow. When the arrow is knocked, the arrow shaft has to be perpendicular to both the arrow shelf or arrow rest and the bow string. The arrow fletching with the odd color out of the three, which in my case was white because the other two were orange, should face away from your body. Both of these factors are extremely important and play a huge role in determining whether the arrow release is straight or not. Many archers mark their knocking point with a small metal ring that is attached to the string using pliers. Doing this ensures that whenever an arrow is knocked, it is in the right spot. As I continued to practice at the range, I moved the target further away. On my first visit to the range, I wanted to record how many arrows I got in each ring based on the color. However, I later learned from an employee at the range that each ring has a point value in competitive shooting. The furthest white ring is one point. As the rings 
continue to move towards the center, the points increase by 1. The two centermost rings both give 10 points, which is the highest possible amount of points that you can get with one shot. Although I gained a lot of knowledge from archery steps to success and from speaking with employees before I practiced, I gained the most knowledge from my lesson. During my lesson, I decided to use a wooden bow with a scope or sight instead of using my fiberglass bow. Using this bow was much easier because of the handle shape that provided a proper grip and because it was heavier. Because the bow was heavier, it was easier to keep it steady when the bow was drawn. Learning how to use this sight was something that I had not originally planned on doing, but I wanted to see how it would affect my accuracy. The results were stunning. Compared to my first score of 265, I got a score of 396. The following list is a list of tips that I got during my lesson. First, you should isolate the motion to your hands only by spreading your shoulders and back. You should put the most pressure on the bow with the space between your thumb and pointer finger when gripping the bow. When you have a proper stance, it should form a T shape when the arrow is drawn. You should always keep space between your fingers and the arrow to prevent it from moving off the arrow rest before it is released. When using the sight, if all of the arrows are clustering to the left of the center, the sight needs to be moved to the left. If they are clustering to the right, the sight needs to be moved to the left. My instructor told me the quote, chase the arrows. When scoring, if the arrow lands on the line, the ring closer to the center is counted for the points for that shot. For a proper follow through, you should push your shoulders back as while also keeping your hands at your face.